Uh, okay, so if you remembered, we talked about uh, the notion of the tangent line, and then I ended up with two examples where we didn't have time to solve them, so let me start solving them, okay? And so, do you remember what was the problem? So, one of the problems, if I remember correctly, uh, so was f of x. I don't know if I if the name was f of x, but it doesn't matter that much. It was one over x, and I gave you the point of tangency only the x coordinate. I gave it to be three. Yes, and then. Uh, I had a question mark for the y coordinate, yes? So when I ask you, I don't remember, what's the name of the function f? I don't know, have you taken notes or what? What's g? Okay, so this was g. So I will take this one. We want to do with just refreshing your memory, okay? So if I want to calculate the k value for this, I'm supposed to find the slope of the tangent line to the graph of this function at the point whose x coordinate is given to be three, yes? Okay, so let us uh, find the k value. So do you remember what we are supposed to do? Do you remember the formulas and things? No? Yes, yeah, say something, nothing. <laughs> Okay, so you have forgotten, okay. Let me just uh, <laughs> mention that. So the K value that we are supposed to calculate for the tangent line follows this rule. Do you remember this is the limit, H goes to zero. The formula that I wrote was with F, okay? But now because my function name is actually G, the only difference is that I make G here, yeah? So it becomes G of a plus h minus g of a divided by h, yes? Somehow remember this. So that was the defining formula for the k value, but the function here, the name of the function is g, so the only thing that I have done is replace g f with g. But then can you, do you remember what was a here in this problem? A was the x coordinate of the point of tangency, which is given to be 3, yes? So what I do first, I just replace this A with 3. So it becomes G of 3 plus H minus G of 3 divided by H. H goes to 0. Yes? Okay, and then what we need to do, you need to replace appropriate expressions instead of this and appropriate, uh, 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 an appropriate number for that. So the number one is actually very simple. So I have a negative sign here. If I want to calculate g of three, what should I do? I need to go to my function, replace the input x with three, because now my input is, x, is, is three. So this becomes one over three, yes? And then if I want to calculate this part, if I ask you what is the input of this function, you would say three plus h is the input of this function. So it means that if I want to write something for this, I need to replace the input with that expression everywhere. There is only one place that x appears, so I would write this. h goes to zero. Is that understandable? So that was the only lesson that I taught you last time. The next lesson is, the cha is chapter one. We are supposed to calculate this limit. And then I told you that these limits are always problematic, yes? Because h is in the denominator and we are always sending h to zero. So it's always the case that the denominator is zero. So I need to start simplifying this expression. So then you need to do something that you learned in the previous chapter, you need to simplify this rational expression. So that's why I emphasize a lot on chapter one, yes? So how should I simplify this? This is the difference between two fractions. So I need to find the LCM in order to find the common denominator. 
But here the common denominator is actually very simple. So what is the common denominator here between this and that? It's just simply the product of these two, yes? Okay, and then I told you this is a quicker way of doing that. You can divide this in your head by that one. It becomes three. And then you multiply that factor by the numerator of that uh, fraction. So it becomes three again, yes? And then I have a negative sign. I repeat the process. I divide this in my head by three. It becomes three plus H. I multiply it by the numerator of the same fraction, which is in case one. So it becomes three plus H. So it's very important to put these pair of brackets around. And then I need to open it up to simplify, yes, because my goal is to simplify this expression as much as possible. So what I do, I uh, remove the pair of brackets, but this minus sign goes for both three and H. Both of them become negative. And then I have three times three plus H divided by H, H goes to zero. Of course, you are not forced to do all of these things. You can do them quicker, but I just want to write everything down so you understand it better, okay? So this three and minus three are gone. So what is left for me is minus H. So let me write it properly. So this becomes minus H divided by three times three plus H. And then I have divided by H, H goes to zero, yes? And then what I need to do, uh, I need to simplify things if possible. So do you remember we had this rule? Uh, we, told, we talked about this in chapter one. If I have a fraction divided by another fraction, what you can do, you can multiply these numbers which are far away from each other and put it in the numerator. Then you can multiply these numbers close together and put them in the denominator, yes? So I will, this is of course a fraction. In the numerator, I have another fraction. In the denominator, I have not a fraction, but any number like this can be assumed to be h over one. So that's also a fraction. Then what I do, I multiply these numbers which are far away from each other. And then you, I told you, you shouldn't be lazy. You should copy and paste this part all the time until the very last step. So one times minus h becomes minus h divided by h multiplied by this expression. So this becomes three times h and three plus h. Now, the good point is that this h is a factor because this is a product and that's also a factor. So this h here and that h there can be simplified. So from the numerator, what is left is minus one. From the denominator, three times three plus h is left, h goes to zero. Now everything is ready. I can plug in h equal to zero there because then it's no problem now, yes? If I put zero here, it is safe. So it becomes minus one. At the very end that I am plugging the number in, I have to remove this note symbol, okay? So this becomes three times three plus zero. Three plus zero is three times three is nine. So as I told you, Last time, the answer is supposed to be minus one over nine. So that's the K value of the tangent line. So what does it mean? It means that if you draw the graph of this function, so if I want to sketch the graph, it's something like this. The graph of this function has two parts, something like this. And this point is one and one, okay? But then this point, has x coordinate equal to three, yes? Yeah? Somewhere, for example, here, one, two, and three. And then this is your point. So it means that if I draw the tangent line to this graph, yes? Something like this. This, what I get here is the slope of that green line, which is tangent to this graph at this point T, yes? And then you can at least see that the, the slope of this green line is negative, yes? It should be negative because it's in this direction. And the calculation also confirms that it's negative. And it is not that big, you know, because one over nine is, so it's close to be horizontal, but negative. So that's the idea of this one. But if I ask you find 
an equation for this green line? Let us continue to remind you again. How should I find an equation? This is just the slope of that green line, okay? How should I find an equation? I need to remind myself that every equation, any equa uh, the equation of every line, except the hard, uh, a vertical one, follows this rule, yes? K, I calculated, the hard part was calculating K. I also need to calculate M. For calculating M, I have to have the coordinates of the point of tangency, both of them, both the X and the Y. The X is given directly in the problem. Sometimes the Y is also given directly, but here the Y is not given you directly, so you have to calculate it yourself. So how should I calculate the co uh, question mark there? How should I calculate? I need to put this number inside my function and calculate this one, yeah? So the question mark from here is actually G of three itself. So it's become one over three. So it means that the point of tangency, X coordinate was given from the beginning, the Y coordinate, I got it here. You see that this point of tangency lies on two uh, and graphs here. One graph is the graph of the original function. One graph is the graph of this uh, uh, tangent line. So it means that its coordinate not only satisfies the equation of the function itself, it also satisfies the equation of the... These are the things that I am repeating are super important to remember, yes? Yeah, it's very important to understand why I can put the numbers there as well. So because this number is not only on the graph, the function but also on the tangent line so it means that the coordinates should satisfy the equation of the tangent line so i replace y with this y coordinate the k value i found it this long process the x coordinate should be replaced by the x coordinate and then plus n and then you see that there is one single unknown in this equation that I can solve and find it, yes? So how should I know that? So it becomes one over three. Three times minus one over nine is minus one over, uh, sorry, it's minus one over three plus, plus n. And I usually try to get rid of fractions. So I multiply everything by three, this becomes one. This becomes minus one, this becomes three M. I move minus one to the left-hand side, it becomes positive two equals to three M. So then it means that M is equal to two over three, yes? So of course, I don't remember what was asked here. You were supposed to only calculate the K value, but if you want to calculate, if you want to find this, the, the tangent line itself, an equation for the tangent line, then you have to write this. Y is equal to minus one over nine times X plus two thirds. So that would be the equation. So it means that if you uh, have GeoGebra, for example, you draw the graph of this function, you draw the graph of this function in the same coordinate system, you see that this line will touches the graph of this function exactly at that point of tangency. That's the idea behind it. Yes, you need to have a picture in mind even though we need to do analytical calculations. Is that clear? Yes? Okay, so if I remember correctly, the next one I wrote A sub X, I think. And then, is that right? And then I gave you another uh, one. So let me write with black, probably it's easier to see later. Uh, so the function, uh, the function S of X equals to square root of X. And I gave you the point of tangency T with X coordinate four and the Y coordinate missing. We were supposed to calculate uh, the slope of the tangent line to the graph of this function at this point, yes? Okay, let me draw the graph. Assume that I give you the graph. I want you to test your understanding. You tell me, is it positive or negative based on the graph? It's important, okay? So let me, I want to test your understanding. Are you with me or not? Uh, 
Assume that you have algebra or your calculator and you draw the graph. This is not part of the solution. I'm just going around the topic so that I make sure that you understand what's going on. You need to understand the connection between the tangent line and the, the notion of the derivative, which we will talk about later. If you draw the graph of this function, it would be something like this, okay? It will be something like this. That's enough for us. Okay, now tell me, what do you guess about positiveness or negativeness of the K value after that long process is done? Was it, would it be positive during this, uh, according to this picture or would, would it be negative? Yes? Positive. Why? I want to have a more concrete slope way. A slope where? Slope. Of course, you are because right. A slope the, here is always positive. But if I have a function going up and down, which that. part is important for me? The, no, not the beginning, this point. Because might be the function you will see. These are very important things. We will talk about them later. So this, you are right, this function is going up in this part, but then suddenly goes down in this part. So it depends which point you are interested in. If I ask you this point, then the tangent line is this line, yes? What type of slope is this? It's a positive slope. I don't know, for example, if I ask you what would be the slope here, then because the tangent line would be in this form, you know that this is K negative, this is K zero, and this is K positive, yes? And for vertical, K is not defined, yes? So these are the things that we studied before. So if I have a line of this form in this direction, the K value is negative, it's horizontal, K is zero. If this is in this direction, K is positive, and it is vertical, K is not defined at all, yes? So this is important. Of course, in this picture, you are right, because this function is always going up, you can say that, yes, the slope is definitely positive. But what I want to, you to understand is that when I want to talk the slope at this point, not, uh, only that part is important. That point on the graph is important for me. Yes. Okay, so if I, for example, have this 4, then can you tell me what would be this here? Yes, two, because I put four here, then it becomes two. And it is clear that in this picture, intuitively it's clear that the slope, this, this, this is the tangent line. And if I ask you, is it the slope positive or negative? You can immediately predict that that is positive. And the calculation should also confirm that. If I calculate and for some reason I get a negative sign, then I, I will get a negative number, then I will be in trouble because then it, it uh, doesn't match with my intuition, okay? So I need to be careful about that. Okay, so let us now do the analytic calculation. You see that this is qualitative analysis, yes? Because I know that this number should be positive, but how much positive, I don't know. I don't, I cannot measure. If I want, I need to have very precise instruments, but even instruments is not enough because they have limits in their precision, okay? So what I need to do, I need to calculate. So help me to calculate that. Let us uh, cherish actually the soul of Newton and Leibniz, yes? By the way, all civilization of human that we are sitting here is because of this very simple question. I will talk about these things later. So at least you can cherish the soul of those guys to memorize those formu that formula, okay? So what is the formula? Can you tell me? Here the name of the function is x, s. So I would write the k value, okay? At, the, at which point, let us make it a little bit better, k value at the four, point four. Uh, okay, let me write the formula first. So what is the formula? Can you tell me? There is a limit. H always goes to zero in this case. The denominator is zero. What, what is the numerator? You remember there was a negative sign here. What is the formula? Yes? S of H. A plus H minus S of A. Exactly, exactly. So you need to remember this formula, even though this formula is given in the, in the formula sheet. Okay, so what should I do? I need now to replace things. Here I know that what is the A value, the value for A is given in the problem. What is A you need to remember? A is the X coordinate of the point of tangency, and that's given to you. So this becomes S of 4 plus H 
minus S of 4 divided by H, H goes to 0. Yes? And now you help me to write the rest of it. So what should I do? I copy and paste this limit part, don't be lazy. And then I have H here. Okay, can you tell me what should I write instead of S of 4? This is so simple that you can calculate it in your head. What is S of 4? Two. Everyone, two. yes, two. two, it's two. Because I put four here, S of four means the square root of four, it's two, yes? So it becomes two. And then I have a negative sign here. What should I replace for S of four plus H? Yeah, come on, say something. Two plus square root. Pardon? Two, two plus square root of H. No, this is, this is very important, not to get confused here. Write it, please, somewhere. I have repeated several times. A square root of A plus B, if you write it as a square root of A plus a square root of B, please write it and cross it over once for all, yes? This is not correct. A square root of A times B, if these are non-negative numbers, it is equal to square root of A square root of B. We can also have a square root of A divided by B. It's a square root of A divided by square root of B if B is positive, A is not negative. But square root of A plus B is not equal to that. Square root of this minus one is not equal to minus one. So be careful about this point. So because if you don't uh, consider this, this will be all being uh, wrong. So what then it is not correct. So what should I write now? Yes, that is the correct word of writing, and I cannot, unfortunately, simplify this on its own right now. But that was the actually hard problem that I taught you in the previous chapter. Do you remember how to get rid of these kinds of limits? Because I cannot put h equal to zero, the numerator becomes zero if I put h equal to zero, the denominator is also zero. But there was a trick that I told you how to do this to get rid of this. Yes? Yes, you need to multiply the numerator, rescale it by the conjugate of this expression, yes? So it means that you have to copy paste everything. So you see that what we learned in chapter one, all, all of them is very useful, all of them are very useful, but that's why I spend so many time on it. So here I need to multiply it by the conjugate of this expression. Okay, and then do you remember what to do now? So this becomes the limit. I told you that in the denominator, you just juxtapose them. You just put them next to each other. You, you don't need to distribute it inside, yes? But in the numerator, what happens? This expression multiplied by that expression forms a conjugate pattern, yes? So the answer becomes the first one to the power of two. So let me be patient and write everything in detail. So this becomes the first one to the two minus the second one to the two. And h goes to zero, yes? And now simplify. Now, this power of two will actually cancel this square root. It becomes four plus h, yes? And then I have this minus sign, two to the power of two. Should I write positive four or negative four? Negative four. Negative four, because this two is only for that one, not for this negative sign. If it was in pair of brackets, then two will apply on the negative sign as well. This is just minus four. And then I told you don't multiply it because we want to have it in factorized form to be able to simplify that, yes? And now what happens? H goes to zero. And then I can simplify the numerator because I have a positive four and a negative four. And we know that these two will be canceled out. So you still, you need to write this limit. Limit h goes to zero. The numerator is h. The denominator is h. Square root of four plus h plus two. Yes? Any questions so far? Okay, uh, what should I do now? It's clear, yes? I can simplify this H. 
with that h, the numerator is left with one. This is also one multiplied by that expression is the same expression. So let me just write it once more. One divided by four plus h plus two, h goes to zero. Now everything is safe, yes? If I put h zero, then that's not a problem anymore because that h that was my problem is now canceled out. So if I put h equal to zero, that's the step that I need to eliminate that symbol because I'm plugging the number in, so it becomes square root of four a plus zero plus two. But then this four plus zero is four, the square root of four is two, two plus two is four, so it becomes one over four. So the slope, and it was actually a positive number, yes? It's a positive number as we predicted. Yes? Okay, so if I ask you to calculate, to determine an equation for the tangent line, for this blue line here, what I'm supposed to do, I need to write this in this form, y equals to kx plus m, yes? And then I know that k value is 1 over 4. So what is the point of tangency? The x-coordinate of the point of tangency is given to be 4. And what is the y-coordinate of the point of tangency? S of 4, which is 2. And then what I need to do, I replace these numbers here. So it becomes 4 equals to 1 over 4 multiplied by 2 plus m. This becomes uh, 4 equals to 1 over 2 plus m. I multiply everything by 2, it becomes 8 equals to 1 plus 2m. And then if I move it here, 7 divided by 2. So m becomes 7 divided by 2. So it means that finally, if I want to write an equation for that blue tangent line, the answer would be something like this. Yes? But of course, it was not wanted, if I remember correctly, in this example. So is that clear? So at least uh, there is also another perspective to derivative, and that was the Newton's perspective. I will come back to this later. But so far, you realize that at least for this mathematical problem, uh, understanding this limit a little bit deeper is important, yes? And unfortunately, you see the calculations are always tedious. You need to do a lot of things. That's, by the way, these functions are very, very simple functions. These are not complicated. If I make the function a little bit more complicated, sometimes it becomes impossible at, at all to calculate that limit because of technical problems. Yes? Um, I have a question. Shouldn't 4 and 2 switch places? Uh, here? No, no, no. In the equation that you did. Here? Yeah. Yes. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's always good to have an eye on me. Yes. Yeah, please, yeah, if, even if you realize it, it's better to shout sooner, okay? So this becomes, uh, so 2 is the y value, sorry. And this has become even simpler, yes? So 2 becomes what? 1 plus m, so m is 1. Thank you very much. So m is equal to 1, so this becomes y equals to 1 over x plus 1. And by the way, I should be able to... I would say to understand. So it means that the m value, do you know this y-intercept? So the m should be somewhere around 1 here. So it means that if I really do it correctly, it will intersect the y-axis exactly at 1. What was the previous number I got? Do you remember? 7 over 2. 7 over 2. So that was... <laughs> if 7, was, 7 over 2 is 3.5, yes? 3.5 is even higher than that one. So it was inconsistent. So it's always good to have this picture in mind, yes? Thank you very much. Okay, now what I, now we want to start the notion. So we realize that this limit, at least for this problem, is important. And please take my word for granted that this limit also appears in a lot of places in science and mathematics itself, okay? So then when, whenever something like this happens, I will talk about the Newton's perspective later, but whenever this happens, mathematicians as actually starts, start sitting and discussing about this and give it a name, for example, because it's always hard to say, do you remember which limit I was talking about? 
Yes, instead of saying like that, they give it a name and they call it, yes? It's as simple as that. This limit is called the derivative, okay? So now I want to start formally doing this, but you need to understand this picture very well. So the first step, when we realize in mathematics that something is important, at the, the minimum thing is that it deserves a name. Okay, so definition here. Okay, so let f be a function. And let A, a number A, belongs to, do you remember this symbol means belongs to, domain of F, okay? And I will talk about domain F, about domain of F later a little bit because we had it in math 2C. So let F be a function and let A belongs to the domain of F. And the derivative, this is the notion that I want to define, the derivative of f at a, or some books write at x equal to a, but let us write it as a. The derivative of f at a, this is not an English article, so let me write, underline it with a, that's a number. The derivative of f at a is denoted by This is the symbol which is used. They put F and put a prime on top of it, and then they write A inside. It's denoted by F prime of A, so you can read it in this way, F prime, F prime of A. And it is defined as follows. Okay, so the definition is this. F prime of A, it's not a surprise. That limit is called the derivative. The F prime of A is the limit of F of A plus H minus F of A divided by H when H goes to zero. Okay, if I want to be very precise, I, I, would, I should write that if this limit exists. Okay, so you don't need to be worried about that part because sometimes the limit doesn't exist at all. Okay, for example, if I ask you what is the limit 1 over x, x goes to 0, the limit does not exist because first of all, if I put x equal to 0, it's not possible and there is nothing that I can simplify that x with. So in this case, the limit does not exist. But that's a minor thing for you. You don't need to be focused on this sentence, but the correct way is to write this, that if this limit exists. Okay? So as simple as that. So now, what is the, dif what is the difference between f prime of a and the slope of the function at point a? Nothing. They are the same thing. Yes, the numbers are exactly the same. So let me give you some simple example. So from now on, this limit is called the derivative of my function at some point. So let, let me make it simple. So let f of x be equal to 2x squared minus 3. Determine f prime of minus 3. So it is not a new lesson at all. What I have done, I have changed the symbol that I am using, yes? So this is an abstract notion, 
But the connection between this abstract notion of derivative with geometry was that the derivative is equal to the slope of the tangent line. If you want to interpret it geometrically, you need to understand. So let me let me do this step by step. We want to determine f prime of minus three. What should I do? I need to write the formula in front of my eyes. So f prime of a is the limit the name of my function, a plus h, this a that you see here is the same a that it's here, minus f of a divided by h, h goes to zero. This is the first step. The second step, I, I see that a is given to be minus three. So I would write f prime of minus three, I, you need to be patient. This is not a hard problem at all. It's a little bit tedious, but it's algorithmically going on. You, you know what to do. The first, the first step is now replace A with minus 3 everywhere. So it becomes F of minus 3 plus H. And then I have F of minus 3 divided by H. H goes to 0. Yes? But this is not something new at all. We talked about this, at least we saw five examples like this. The only thing that we have done, we changed the name. That uh, Before it was called the slope, now it's called the rivet. They are the same thing actually. So let us do it a little bit more quicker, yes? So this would be the limit uh, instead of, let us do it, what is f of minus three? f of minus 3, by the way, if it's hard for you, you can come to the side of your paper, margin of your paper, and calculate them there, and then move them here. So f of minus 3 is what? It's 2 minus 3 to power 2 minus 3. So what is the answer? Minus 3 to power 2, positive 9 times 2, 18. 18 minus this is 50. So this answer is 50. Yes? Okay, so what should I do? I can calculate f of minus 3 plus h. It means that I need to replace the input by this new input everywhere. There is only one place that you see the input appears here, and that is here. So you would write 2 times minus 3 plus h to power 2 minus 3. And then the answer here is 15, so it becomes minus 15. And then h goes to 0. The denominator is also equal to h. Is that understandable? Yes? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. yes. And then we simplify. So the simplification, you need to do it step by step. So here, which one has the priority? I have an exponent, a power, and I have a product. Some of you, I have seen that you multiply two inside first. This is wrong. You have to raise it to power to remember the power has the priority over the product. Yes? So you need to first raise it to power two. So it means that you need to keep two. You raise it to power two, it becomes nine. Two times the first one times the second one is minus six H. And then the second one to power two. Minus three minus 15 is minus 18. And then you have this divided by H. H goes to zero. Yes? So I need to simplify it again. I multiply this inside so it becomes 18 minus 12H plus 2H squared. And then I have a negative 18 at the end. And then this H, H goes to zero. And then you see that this 18 and that 18 are gone. What is left for me is this. The limit of minus 12h plus 2h squared divided by h, h goes to zero. And this is something very simple for you from chapter one. So how should I simplify this? You see that there is a 2h in common, I can factor it out. So this becomes the limit of 2h, it becomes minus six, this becomes 2h, oh, sorry, h divided by h, h goes to zero. And then this h and that h are gone. Yes? Then what happens? Uh, 2 is left, and then I put h equal to zero. So 2, if I put h equal to zero, it becomes minus 6 times 2 is minus 12. 
Okay, so what I get is minus 12. So the answer would be f of f prime of minus 3 is minus 12. Now, can, how do you read this? If I ask you what is the meaning of this calculation, if you want to give me a geometric picture, how do you talk about it? So what is the interpretation of this minus 12? Yeah, try to talk about it to learn it because it's important. So what is the meaning, geometric meaning of this number? Yes? Yeah? It's the k value of the tangent line. Now make it more complete, yes? That's exactly the case. But tell me the point so which where, because if you have a curve, you can have infinitely many tangents in different places, yes? I want to talk it very completely, yes? Um, if you look at the curve, and then you take... Not a curve. This curve. Yeah, okay. Yes, this is very important. You're talking in mathematics, yes? So it means that if I draw the curve of this function, yes? Okay. Um, then you look at the x coordinate when it's minus 3. Yes, when you go to minus 3, there is a point on the graph, yes? And then... And the tangent line of that will have a k value of minus 3. Yeah, exactly. So it means that I don't know, for example, you don't need to know the graph of this quite well, but of course this is parabola, this is not very hard, but it means that you draw the graph of this function, you find the x coordinate equal to minus 3, go up, you find the point on the curve. On that point, you draw a tangent, okay, which is tangent to the graph at that point, then the k value of that tangent line is minus 12. So it's important to understand from geometrical point of view, when you calculate the derivative, what you are calculating actually. Okay, is that clear? But now let us talk a little bit about, you see that this is a little bit boring and tedious all the time. For example, if I ask you, if I say that, okay, sorry, I made a mistake, I meant to calculate f prime of two, then what you need to do? Not, more or less, none of these calculations is useful. You have to redo it all over again. And say that, okay, sorry, I'm really sorry, I meant f prime of zero. Then you have to repeat all the calculations from the beginning to the end for zero. And then you realize, might be I'm a little bit mentally sick. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you need to find a way. What would be the best way to answer something like me to, to make me shut to uh, shut down? Yes. How do you answer me? If you realize that I am just teasing you by giving you different numbers, and you cannot first of the first thing is probably you escape. But assume that you are not allowed to escape or you cannot escape. How do you uh, make me silent? Yes. <laughs> okay, you don't have the calculator. So what is the best thing to do? I'm intentionally asking this question because this motivates you what is the correct way. And that was the motivation the mathematician actually was facing. Yes? No. Analytically, because graph is limited. You cannot read exact values, mathematically exact values by looking at the graph. If you see that GeoGebra gives you the answer, GeoGebra is cheating because the, the GeoGebra knows how to take the derivative and gives you the answer. Now it is very, very simple. You see, let me just, I might be, I, I tell you that, okay, calculate this, you have to do this. I say that, okay, I change my mind, I calculate the next number, I give you the next number, you have to do this. And I change my mind again, I give you another number, you have to do this over again. Okay, and I change my number again, you have to do it all over again. So what you do, technically, yes? And you put 2x squared minus 3, replace it. Yeah, you are getting close, but not exactly. Exactly, talking me exactly. So you would say that let me find a formula for yeah. you. You can go and sit down and play it around, yes, with yourself. So you mean so you can just find a formula for not this value, for not zero, for I don't know, for every possible value that you can imagine. Yes? So instead of giving me a particular number, you say that look, let us do this. 
Where is this? Okay, let us do this. Let us do it, by the way, for this problem. Uh, you say that, okay, I realize that if I calculate this one, you immediately change your mind and change my number. Look, let me do it like this. I know that f prime at a is given to be the limit of f of a plus h minus f of a divided by h. h goes to zero. Yes? Let me work with a itself. And when I find the formula, you give me a, I put it in my formula, I give your answer instead of doing it all over again. So I want to design... I want to invent, I want to discover a formula, not for minus three, not for zero, but for, for all possible values of A. The calculation is a little bit more tedious than this calculation, because then there are two variables involved. One of them is A, one of them is H. Here, after this step, I have only one variable left for me. Usually for you, working with numbers is easier than working with algebra. But by little by little by experience, you see that algebra is easier, at least for this particular question. So let us answer this question here, once for all. Yes? So let me, I want to ask you, I want you to actually participate in this calculation. I want to calculate f prime of a for that function. Okay, so what can I do? These parts are not affected. There is a negative sign here. Okay, tell me what can I write for f of a? What can I write? Yeah, what can I write? Yes? Uh, two times uh, h plus... No, what is f of a? Plus a. Yes? Two a squared minus three. Yes. Because this f is an, an operator, I told you. Assume that x is your input. When you put the input to the function, it is square it, multiply it by 2, subtract 3 from it, give it back to you. Yes? So what does it mean? It means that f of a is the same thing. So it becomes 2a squared minus 3. But this is very, very important to put this pair of brackets around it. Is that understandable? This is your f of a. F of A in this problem was 15. Because it was number, I was able to calculate this numerically. But this is a letter. I cannot calculate it numerically. I need to keep it in this form. Okay, let me test you again. What should I write for F of A plus H? Someone else? Yes? F of 2A squared minus 3 plus H. Let me, let me again. F of, I mean, what do you write instead of this question mark? What do you write here? Uh, 2A. 2. Yes, you said F. 2. Yeah. Okay. Uh, A squared. You mean this? Yeah, minus 3 plus H goes to the row. Yeah, so this is not correct. So this is very simple. Let me, so you don't talk to me. This is why I cannot fix you. Let me tell you once for all, okay? A function, if you have forgotten, a function has an input and has an output, okay? This number here is not x, is nothing. It's just representing your input. And then you need to understand what the function does to your input. You need to read it in words. This function will take my input Square it, multiply it by two, subtract three from it. Yes, yes, Ayla? I know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that. Okay. okay. So it's two times uh, a minus h. No, listen to me. Okay. So let me listen to me. What if I ask you? Let me ask you. I am asking Ayla. What is the input here? A plus h. The input is a plus h, and what is the role of this function? I told you. It takes your input, x, square it. So your input, you are saying that this is a plus h. So the function will square your input, yeah. then multiply it by 2, and then, minus three. and then minus 3. 
please uh, learn this because mostly you cannot solve the problem and get the points in the exam because you are big in the calculation of the functions. This is, is that understandable? So you need to understand what is the meaning of a function. Function takes you an input. The name of the input is not important at all. This is playing the role of an input. You need to understand how this function applies on your input. Okay, everyone happy with this now? Is that clear? So let me write it here. So it is 2 a plus h to power 2 minus 3, yes? And now the hard part is this part because you need to understand, you need to be skillful in algebra, which we trained in the previous chapter a lot. So you need to expand and simplify this as much as possible. You have two variables here. Usually in the first chapter, we have X and Y variables, A and B variables, but here we have A and H variables, it doesn't matter. So let us continue together. So this becomes the limit. What should I do? Am I allowed to multiply two here? Now just talk to me. No. no, what should I do? I need to square it. So it becomes A squared plus two times the first one times the second one, plus the second one to the two. And then I have a minus three, is that right to write this or not? That's not right. No, I have to write plus, yes? And then divided by h, h goes to zero. So then what happens? What is the next step? The good point is that, let us get rid of this guy. Minus three and three, okay? <laughs> that is the weak one. We can attack the weeks, yes? So here, we have multiplied two here. So it becomes two a squared plus four a h, plus 2h squared, and then I have minus 2a squared, okay? Another poor guy is gone, yes? And that is 2a squared and minus 2a squared. And then what is left for me is the limit of 4ah plus 2h squared divided by h, h goes to zero, okay? You see two variables, but which one deserves the name of a variable here, H or A? These are letters, but which one is a variable? Yes? A. No. Because you see that what you are sending close, you are sending H close to zero, so you are varying the values of H. You are making it a smaller and a smaller, but you are not touching the value for A. So even though A appears here, it's not, a, uh, it's not a variable, it's a constant, yes? As far as this is concerned, yes? So what should I do? H is still in the denominator. So you have enough experience of this. What should I do? I take a 2H out from this term and that term. What is left here? It is 2A, yes? And what is left here is just H. And then divided by H h goes to zero, then what happens? This h and that h are gone. And then it becomes the limit. If I multiply, for example, two inside, it becomes 4a plus 2h. And now you see that h is supposed to go to zero. So what would be the answer of this limit? Say something for it, 4a, yes? Okay, so what, what, uh, I answered this question, okay? So what was the formula I got? Uh, so now you can present this to mentally sick people and they can introduce the, the, for the numbers themselves, yes? For example, if I have minus three, A is minus three, put it here, what is the answer? Minus 12. And that minus 12 is there. Now, the good point is that if I ask you this, it is not hard at all. It's not tedious anymore. You don't need to go do the calculation once overall. Do you see the calculation here? I agree. It's a little bit harder than the calculation here. But the good point about this is that you found a formula not just for minus 3, for all possible values of A. So that's the benefit, okay? So if I ask you what is f prime of zero, you can immediately answer. What's the answer? Zero. If I ask you what is f prime of the square root of three, what's the answer? Come on, say something, yes? You don't understand or you hesitate to talk. 
what is this number? <laughs> I'm getting crazy. Okay, so what's this number now? What's the prime of the square root of three? It's three. So mm -hmm. it's the square root of three to the power of two times two. So six. F the prime of three. <laughs> Yes, do you, do you, so let, let us see. Do you really understand what's going on? Because I, I'm, I don't know, this is my feeling, but this is very hard for me to read people's face in Sweden, okay? I see question marks on top of your head. Is that right or wrong? I like that one. So, yes? Okay, I got a three. It's four times minus three, right? Yes, yes, we got a formula. So right. the, let us read this formula. I want to understand what's the problem. So you see, I calculated a prime at any point A. It gives me four times that A. Yes? yes? Not for any particular A. A can be any number. Yes? So what I told you that F prime of A is four times A. If I ask you what is F prime of minus three, it means that I replace A with minus 3. It becomes 4 times minus 3. The answer becomes minus 12, which is confirmed by the previous calculation. If I ask you what is F prime of 0, how did I get this 0? I multiplied 4 times 0. The answer is 0. So that was a coincidence that they are the same. If I ask you what is F prime of 1, what is the answer? 4, because now the input of this is one, you multiply it by four, it becomes four. Is that understandable? So we got a formula for this function for all possible values of A. Now, can you tell me what is the answer to this? What? Yes, say. Pardon? Four times the square root of three, yes. So the answer to this is four times the square root of three. Is that understandable? I thought you wanted the answer. Yeah, like no, this is you are in the second grade. How can I understand? I myself don't know square root of three. I know this is one point seven one. More than that, I don't know. I am always talking about. You don't believe me, yes? You have to work with exact values. Okay. So it means that what is this one? This is the best that even the mathematics professor can tell you. Yes, four square root of three, and that's the best answer that someone can give you. Four times the square root of three. So if you if you hesitate to answer these kind of questions, it means that your weakness is somewhere else. You need to go and fix it. Is that clear now? Okay. Now there is another problem. So what is the problem here? The sick people can the sick person can come in again. <laughs> this time he can okay, he we solved the problem. Yes, that person comes in and asks you another question. What would be another question? He wants to change. <laughs> yeah, he wants to change the function. <laughs> okay, so it means that this game will not end. So what we can do, and then the, the news is that the game still hasn't ended <laughs> from the Newton's time. But we have tables. We have tables that we have uh, the formulas for the derivatives of functions in those tables. Okay, and then if some person comes in, we just look into our list and give his answer or her answer, okay? Uh, but now assume that you want to set up that table. How do you start setting up that table? First of all, is that table huge or not? How many? So it means that, so it means that two factors are important when it comes to derivatives, yes? The form of the function itself play the final the play a very important role to the number that you get. This is one thing. Another which plays a very important role is the number that you put inside the derivative. This number was not that hard to solve. We just solved it here, at least for this function. So it means that if I keep the function the same, my problem is solved. It doesn't matter which number you ask me. I put it here and immediately give your answer. Is that clear up to this point? Yes or no? Yes or no? Okay. And now the point is that if I change my function, then unfortunately I have to redo all the calculation 
And that sick person problem is not that kind. He can ask you to calculate the derivative of this function, for example. Yes, square root of x squared plus 1, I don't know, minus sine of x divided by cosine x times ln of x, I don't know, to the power of 100 or so. Okay? So I just want to see the problem is really serious. Even if you <laughs> spend some time and solve this problem, this, pro this person can multiply this by that and add something to it and ask you again. So it, it's, it's, it is a very, very serious problem because we have infinitely many functions in mathematics. And if I, of course, in principle, I can give you a formula for each function, but if you have a test, you need to have infinitely many papers to be able to write all the formulas down and infinitely many time to look for the function that is appearing in the test, yes? So how do you solve this problem? You don't. Pardon? You don't. No, this has been solved. <laughs> we don't is the easiest probably way to do that. No, but think a little bit logically if you want to really to do that. So assume that you want to do something like this, which is useful for others. Where do you start? Come on, it's not hard. <laughs> if you have a lot of mess, okay, in your room, you want to find something, what, do you, what is the first thing you do? Yes. I sell my room. What? I sell my room. Yes. Okay, so just translate this idea here into mathematics. Uh, no, it's, no, program is coming later. Yes, but for, even for program, what, how do you program it? Assume that you have a supercomputer, you cannot ask it all the time, okay? You want to, you, you need to find a way. It is not that hard, I think. I don't know, probably my mind is a little bit <laughs> biased. But if you want to solve something like this, you have infinitely many possibilities. The first thing you do, this has been done in, I don't know, in biology, in science. For example, if you want to study plants, if you want to study insects, the first thing is to categorize them. It's not hard. It's not. So you probably you don't have to, that connection with mathematics here. So it, we have infinitely many functions in mathematics. We have a large number of insects out there. Biologists categorize them into different species or whatever they know. So here in mathematics, the idea is the same. Categorize the functions that appear in mathematics. Yes, this is the first thing that you need to do. Is it logical or not? Yes, you have infinitely many functions involved and then you see that these functions could be extremely hard to calculate this limit for. It is very, very out of reach in the beginning, I agree. But very, very interesting theorems are proven by mathematicians that facilitate this process. Very So if you ask me what is the derivative, I can. I can spend five minutes to calculate the derivative of that. Not by that way by using the rules that are invented, okay? So the first, so it means that I need to categorize. Hopefully I could motivate you that categorizing your functions is the first step. So the first, so it means that I start with the simplest possible type of functions. Can you tell me what is the sim, give me a very simple function first. For example, f of x is equal to x squared minus 3 is not a complicated function, but I can um, imagine functions simpler than this. Yes? x equals to zero, or f of x equals to 0. f of x equal to 0 is probably the simplest possible function. But f of x equal to 1 is also in the same category. f of x equal to 3 is also the same category. These are the constant functions. Yes? So the constant functions are the functions that doesn't do anything at all to your input. For example, what Jakub said actually is that f of x equal to zero. This is probably the simplest possible function. So if I ask you what is f of five, can you answer this question for this function? Zero. Zero. If I ask you what is f of six? Still zero. It's still zero. So the constant function doesn't care at all to the input. 
Yes? It gives you zero. So it doesn't care what you put in. The answer is zero. But another type of, so this is a constant function whose value is always zero. But let me ask you, for example, another type of function. Uh, another, now let me consider this function, but f of x equal to one. If I ask you what is f of five, what is your answer? One. one. f of two is again one. So you see that there is no specific row for this zero. So all these type of functions that you have a constant number on the right hand side is are probably the simplest possible functions. These are called constant functions. Yes. So what I, what I want to do, I want to set up a table, but how many constant functions you have? Can you tell me? Infinitely many. But I don't need to consider all infinitely many. I can say that I have a constant function. For constant functions, this is the formula. So it means all infinitely many constant functions as one single formula, yes? This is the way that you need to categorize the functions. So let us do this together. And I want your help, okay? Okay, so let me call it a constant. In Swedish, constant is, starts with K, but let us talk in English, so I call it C. Constant. So f of x equal to C, I emphasize that C is a constant. Okay, and then I set up a table. This table starts with mat 3 c ends in mat 4 Okay, so it will continue to uh, put functions inside the table. Yes, so the first function that we start today is the constant function. We want to see what is the derivative. What is the derivative? Okay, and I told you what was the formula. The formula was f prime of a, but now there is no difference between a. Let me write x. So can you translate it for me? What is f prime of x? I am re replacing the letter a. We usually in mathematics, we use x. So this becomes f. What should I write here? Say it loud, yes? What should I write here? X plus h, x plus h thank you. Minus? F of x, great. If divided by h, h goes to zero. Yes? This is my formula. Now, help me to calculate it for this function. If I ask you what is c, I don't know. What I know is that a is a constant. Whatever it is, it's not important. Okay, help me to write it down. What is f of x? This is the simplest one. What can I write instead of f of x? c. c. Now, help me. What can I write instead of f of x plus h? Please try to answer it correctly, okay? Otherwise, I will get mad. C again, yes? Agree? Because you are saying that the input is x, the function will give you c. It doesn't care about the input. You are changing the input to another thing. I agree, it's x plus h, but this function doesn't care. It's constant. So it will give you what? C. c. And then divided by h. h goes to zero. But everyone knows what is c minus c. We don't need to know the value for c. Whatever it is, c minus c is zero. So this becomes zero divided by h, h goes to zero. A fraction whose numerator is zero is what? What? A fraction whose numerator is equal to zero is? Zero. 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 Because the denominator is very negligible. It's not zero. Zero divided by something very small is zero. Very good. So it means that I categorize. A constant function, its derivative is zero. Okay. So if I ask, if I give you this function, please tell me. If I ask you what f of x is the square root of two, write something in front of this. What is this? What is the answer? Zero. Why? Because this function is a constant function. Here, the constant is a square root of two. Another question. X is equal, f of x is equal to this famous pi. Pi number. So tell me, what is f prime of x? Zero. zero. Because pi is a constant, yes? It's zero. So whenever I have a function which is a constant, its derivative is very, very simple. It is zero. Another question. f of x, let me write the change name of my function. g of x is equal to pi squared plus pi. Yeah, plus pi. 
what is the derivative of this function? It's still zero, yes? Because pi squared is a constant. I don't know the exact value, but who cares? That's a constant. That's a constant. That's a constant. I am adding some constants. It's a constant at the end. So it, what is the derivative? Tell me. Is? Is? Zero. <laughs> I don't know. For your class, just moving your jaws is very hard. <laughs> just move it, okay? That's a good exercise. Then you can feel what I feel, yes? <laughs> moving my jaws eight hours a day. Yes, yeah, you need to feel it. Okay, so uh, this is very important that we categorize that. So you know, you know that we are categorizing our functions. Okay, by the way, do you, this, does this answer somehow squares with your geometric intuition about derivative? So if I have a constant function, what is the graph of that function? What is the graph of a, a constant function? What type of picture you expect? Yes? It's a uh, flat. It's a horizontal line. Yes? And in the horizontal line, of course, it is very strange. It means that at each point, the slope of the tangent line is equal to zero. And that's somehow understandable because if I have, of course, this is a little bit strange. If I have this, if I ask you to draw a tangent line to this line at this point, what do you get intuitively? It's the line itself. Yes? So the tangent lines to lines are lines. They lines it themselves. This is in, it's not that clear because tangent makes sense when you have curves, yes? But because I told you that I didn't talk very rigorously, that was the definition of the tangent. So remember, if I ask you what is the tangent line to this line at this point, you should say the line itself. And then if this is horizontal, the tangent line remains horizontal. So it means that the slope is going to be zero. Yes? That's intuitive. Okay, now I am waiting for you. So we actually did a very big job. We found the derivative of infinitely many functions. All of them categorized under the title of constant functions. But now we want to increase the difficulty. We want to make it more diverse. So what would be the next function that you imagine? I don't want to teach it now, but I, got, I want you to just to guess it. So if, I, if you want to, so you realize what you can do with constant functions. Increase the level of difficulty a little bit more. Yes? F of x is x. x. Yeah, that's very good. So probably this is after the constant functions, probably f of x equals to x is the simplest one. Okay. Now, if I want to increase the difficulty a little bit, what would be the next function? Yes? Next equals x plus 1. Yes, x plus 1. Yes. So and, uh, so, and then, in principle, you can say, you can talk about two things. Yes? You can say that x is probably the simplest one after this. But as you told, you can write x plus 1. Someone can say x plus 2. Someone can say x minus 5. All of them. So if I want to categorize them, how do I categorize them? X plus, C. X plus C. Yes. Okay. Still, I can do some some kind of change here. If I want to say, if I want to look at it in a different way. So one way is to add a constant. One way is to multiply a constant. Instead of adding a constant, I can multiply it by two. If I want to, I can multiply it by three. If I want to, I can multiply it by one half, and etc. So that's also one type of problems that I need to solve the problem, yes? And one, one other type is that, what should I do? There's another way of increasing the difficulty. Exponents. Exponents, exactly. So I need to write, I can write x to the 2. I can write x to the 3. X to the C. I can write x to any number a in the book. It has used a, so I use a. Yes? x to the c is better, probably. Because C shows a constant, and that's a better notation. So you see, we want to solve these problems later. OK? So that would be the topic of the next lesson. So you realize what we want to do. We started to setting up this table, functions, categories of functions, 
and their derivatives. Okay, so that is very, it takes a long time as from us to, to set up this table and it will not finalize this year, it will be finalized next year. Okay, so this is what we want to restore. But uh, of course, at some point we stop it and we talk about applications of derivative and in math four, if you come with me, then we will talk, go back and complete this again.